Welcome to Eggs and Issues, a monthly business program presented by the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Hello, I'm Mike Violet from News Radio WGAN. Eggs and Issues is supported by presenting sponsors Bank of America and Martins Point Healthcare, in cooperation with Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, Oxford Networks, and WEX. And now, please welcome the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce President Quincy Hensel from Industrian. Good morning and Happy New Year. Thank you so much for joining us today as we kick off 2016 with another great program here at Eggs and Issues. My name is Quincy Hensel. I am the Director of Community Outreach at Industrium, and I also serve as the Volunteer President of the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. And today we have a great presentation in store. Mark Bazier, Director of the Portland Museum of Art, is here with us today, and we'll talk about how the PMA is reimagining itself. But first, I do want to take just a quick moment to talk about the chamber as we enter into the new year. Over the weekend, you may have seen an article that ran in the Portland Press Herald. Professor Richard Berenger and Frank O'Hara published an op-ed focusing and highlighting the challenges we face in Portland as our region grows larger. From transit and housing to homelessness and drug abuse, these challenges are real and the business community must be engaged in finding solutions and helping to find community consensus. And this is where the chamber can lead and make a difference. The Portland Community Chamber Board is currently undertaking an exercise of identifying our goals and priorities for the coming year, many of which are the same issues that were laid out in the article over the weekend. This is in an effort to be proactive, to help better serve you, our membership, and to get out in front of issues to be more impactful. The chamber can be a resource, and the chamber also wants to encourage and help shape change in our city. So I invite all of you to think about this and to contact me or anyone else you may know at the Portland Community Chamber about what you think your chamber should be focusing on as we enter into 2016. In the coming months, I'll report back to this group in this forum and we'll continue this dialogue, and I'd like to engage all of you, our membership, as we all move towards a greater and more prosperous city and region. So more to come on that front in the coming months. Now I can move on with our program. As we all know, this program is made possible by our generous sponsors, and I'd like to take a moment to just give them all a shout out from the podium and extend a huge amount of gratitude for their continued support of Eggs and Issues. Our presenting sponsors are Bank of America and Martins Point Healthcare. Cooperating sponsors, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, WEX, and Oxford Networks. Reception sponsors, Clark Insurance, KeyBank, and IDEX. Parking sponsor, Identity Group, Allen Signs with Impact. Headlight Audiovisual provides us with our overall production support, and they join us each and every month in the back of the room there and run this show. Thank you all for all that you do each month at Eggs and Issues. Time Warner Cable's digital service video on demand broadcasts our program each month. You can watch it when you want and as many times as you want. The Forecaster is our print sponsor. Main Biz is our e-media partner. WGAN is our radio sponsor who, as you know, interviews our guests at the Holiday Inn every month. WMTW serves as our broadcast partner. We also thank our special community partners, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, New England Cancer Specialists, the Bangor Daily News, and University of Southern Maine. AAA Northern New England and Springboard Staffing support our Tomorrow's Leaders and Entrepreneurs program, which allows high school and college students to attend Eggs and Issues every month. Today, we welcome students from Cape Elizabeth High School, Casco Bay High School, Southern Maine Community College, and the University of Southern Maine. We also have with us today Father George Collins, the president of Chevrous High School, as well as other faculty here from Chevrous. I know that their students are in the middle of midterms, so are hopefully either at home getting extra sleep or studying. We hope so anyway. Um, but if all of you here from the area high schools and universities could please stand and be recognized.
I see Glenn Cummings, president of USM, in the audience as well. Thank you for joining us. Baker Newman Noise sponsors our Community Corner program, which allows our area nonprofits to highlight their organizations here at Eggs and Issues every month. And today's Community Corner is Camp Sunshine. Camp Sunshine, located in Casco, Maine, is a national retreat for children with life-threatening illnesses and their families. As the only camp of its kind in the nation, they served more than 700 families from 42 states and seven countries in 2015. There is no cost to participating families thanks to their generous and gracious supporters. Whether working with Navy SEALs to swim the length of Sebago Lake, disp displaying 10,000 jack-o'-lanterns at their pumpkin festival, or providing guests at their suitcase party the opportunity to board a private jet for New York City, Camp Sunshine continues to be humbled by the local corporate sponsorships they develop. One of Camp Sunshine's largest annual fundraisers consists of a series of 10 polar plunges along the East Coast, one of which is taking place on January 30th. It's the Portland Polar Dip at the East End Beach. And they have an open invitation for all of you to participate. <laughs> And I would actually encourage all of you in the room to consider participating in this event. I personally am not one to do something that makes me feel completely uncomfortable, like jumping in the freezing ocean in the middle of winter. However, I have personally seen the benefits of Camp Sunshine. I have dear friends who had a son who fought a very long and courageous battle with cancer at the young age of five. And he and his family attended Camp Sunshine and it was truly an amazing experience for that family. And I know that the Camp Sunshine provided them with support and respite and joy. And this was all to a family who was going down an incredibly difficult journey. So participating in an event like the Polar Plunge Dip seems to be the least that we can do to support families who are going through extremely challenging times. Michael Smith, Director of Special Events, and Kaylee Walker, the Development Associate, are here representing Camp Sunshine. If you could please stand and be recognized. Thank you for all that you do and for joining us today. While we are still in the recognition portion of the program, I do want to recognize any new chamber members who might be with us today. If you are a new member, will you please stand? We have several in the room. Thank you all for joining us this morning as well. Now we will move on to today's presentation, and just a reminder, there will be a Q&A segment after our presenter wraps up their remarks. There are microphones in the middle of the room. If you could use those and introduce yourself before posing your question, that would be fantastic. You can also tweet questions using our hashtag, eggs and issues. Today, I am pleased to welcome our presenter, Mark Bazier, the director of the Portland Museum of Art. Mark was named director of the PMA in 2009. The PMA is Maine's oldest public art institution, serving more than 140,000 visitors annually, including 9,000 members and 8,000 school children. As director, Bazir directs the PMA's entire operation with an annual budget of 5.5 million and a staff of 80 professionals, interns, and volunteers. Mark continues to seek opportunities to draw new visitors and a diverse audience to the PMA, as well as provide the local community with greater access to thought-provoking and engaging works of art. He has published widely, including three books with MIT Press, and is active in local, community, and national public art programs and lectures on museum studies. Mark is a member of the Association of Art Museum Directors, serves on the Board of Advisors at Space Gallery and the University of Southern Maine Board of Visitors. He has also served as a member of the Maine Arts Commission. Mark is a founding board member of a nonprofit organization, Africa Schoolhouse, which is dedicated to building schools in rural Africa. Mark strives to ensure the PMA's relevancy into the future by spearheading initiatives to expand museum offerings, improve accessibility, and continue to enrich the lives of its diverse visitors. And that is what he will be focusing on today. It is my honor to introduce to you Mark Bazir. Good 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome, and thank you, Quincy, and thank you to all these wonderful sponsors at Camp Sunshine. You guys do such great work. We're very proud of that. Um, and I'm proud to follow Quincy up here. And I am a little bit nervous because I'm taking a little bit different tack today on the Portland Museum of Art. So I'm going to encourage you all to look at the slides on the sides because you're going to see a lot of great art. While I'm talking, I'm going to give you a little bit of context where we're headed today in this conversation. Um, as I said here, as I said in my notes even here, I'm a little bit nervous about this. Um, and I'm looking at my CFO, our CFO over here, um, Elena Henry. And the reason I'm nervous is one of the things that influences the way in which I think about management is a book called Moneyball. And Moneyball is a book by Michael Lewis. And Michael Lewis also wrote Liar's Poker and The Big Short, which is actually a film at the Nick right now. And what I like about uh, this book and about Moneyball, and you might call it Moneyball PM, is the sense that um, in the early 2000s, um, the Oakland Athletics, the baseball team in the West, had an amazing team, all these young players. And the next year, all those young players were so good, the A's could not afford to keep them. So mostly the Yankees bought all of his great players, and they went across the Major League Baseball. Billy Bean, who was the general manager, recognized that with a budget of under $50 million, there is no way he could compete with the New York Yankees with a budget of $125 million. He dug deep to try figure out how do you compete in a small market? How do you identify value to compete way over your scale? How do you do that? What we will find out in Moneyball is the ways in which he used creative statistics and he finds the opportunity and change to take advantage of the game, which has really turned its back on change. And Billy Bean is really an example of, I think, a manager who had the guts to really go for it and make it happen. And I think that's kind of what we're trying to do at the Portland Museum of Art. So here we go. I also should mention that I'm a huge New York Mets fan, and um, I have been following Billy Bean since 1984 when he was our top prospect and totally was terrible. He was a terrible player, but he's a great manager. So thank you to the Chamber for recognizing that the economy of the Portland region is a strong ecology made up of businesses and nonprofits. Our Chamber understands the economic impact of nonprofits as well as their impact on the quality of life that drives great cities like Portland. The museum's business partnership program is our fastest growing membership today. We're very proud that the business community considers the museum an important player representing the best of Portland and all the potential that we have. In many ways, the museum has become a symbol for this city. It is a place of pride for our community, and like many of your businesses, we fight well over our weight class, showing Portland how much potential we have. We also have one of the strongest memberships in the country for our demographic and size. So I'm gonna to go to the remote and pull up some gorgeous paintings. One of the things we have at the Portland Museum Art is gorgeous imagery. How did the museum gain this place in the life of Portland and Maine? It begins with the great role Maine has played in building local, regional, and national identity. We are considered one of the most important regional museums in the country. This is because our local story, the story, the story we tell with our artists like Frederick Church, Winslow Homer, Rockwell Kent, Hopper, I'm gonna go back because those are so beautiful, Rockwell Kent and Hopper, both on Monhegan, Alice Katz and Lois Dodd. These artists are as much a main story as they're a national story. So remember that. These are as much of a local story to our heritage as they are to the United States as a whole. These are our local artists that are considered the best artists in the country. Art that is made in Maine is part of a national conversation. For well over 100 years, artists of Maine have been helping construct a national identity. It's hard to seek American identity without acknowledging the powerful work of Winslow Homer and Frederick Church. And we think Portland and New England has a lot more to say. We may be frugal and we may be efficient, but we are very ambitious and we are very progressive. And of course, our story is told with a wonderful backdrop with some of the most significant buildings in the state of Maine. 
That's an image of all of our great buildings. We really are, in many ways, a museum of historical buildings. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Jeff Kane, our board president. And I saw Beth Thetine and Lenny Nelson, other members of our board. And if I didn't see others because I have my glasses off, I want to welcome the board here and also much of the staff of the Portland Museum of Art and thank them for all the great work that they do. And Jeff Kane really is a fantastic leader at the museum. Thank you, Jeff. Every day I walk to work, I think about how do we going to involve our members? How are we going to grow our visitorship? Our competition is the entertainment business and the time pressures on everyday life, not cultural institutions. Like you, the PMA fights every day for relevance and for market share. We bring 150,000 people into the Congress Square area every single year. Those folks park, they shop, they eat food, they come to the museum, we are a generator of economic activity. And as Quincy mentioned, we employ approximately 80 to 90 people at the museum. Another great painting, Dark Harbor by N.C. Wyeth. How does a painting compete in the digital world? The museum tries to make art relevant in our everyday lives through a combination of artistic vision and excellent nonprofit management. So who do we look to to think about management? Who do we look to as models for how to run a museum in the 21st century? It's very different than it used to be. The way we run the museum is a very different kettle of fish than it had been even 20, 25 years ago. Folks that I look at, as I mentioned, Michael Lewis um, from Moneyball, but I also look to Leon Gorman, Tom Chappell, and Adam Bryant. Leon Gorman's complete understanding of brand management and customer service influences how we project institutional identity and focus on members, visitors, and artists. Tom Chappell of Toms of Maine reveals his seven intentions of value-centered leadership. At the PMA, it helped build a horizontal structure that empowers employees whose values added equity to the brand. In turn, that equity empowers the PMA's connection with our audiences. Our partnerships and collaborations are now value-based, making partners stronger through the cross-pollination of brands and audiences. Tom also really makes work meaningful for us every day in our lives. The book Quick and Nimble by Adam Bryant reveals how fast the work and marketplace changes today and how we all need to build in the notion of what we call continuous improvement by always being prepared to identify the opportunity in change. A good example of this, you have an image of the Portland Public Library in the PMA and the great renovation that Scott Simons Architects did. For 20, about 20 years ago, the devil, re excuse me, for example, less than 20 years ago, people thought the digital revolution was going to wipe out the relevance of libraries and museums. Rather than give up, we found the opportunity and change. Libraries became more open and embraced the idea that they were as much about information and community as books. They took information technology to the global level while embracing the local by creating spaces where people could come together. At first, museums tightly guarded their images. We refused to share digital imagery of our paintings and our works of art. Just a few years ago, the number one interaction in the museum was no photographs. That was the number one things we told our visitors. Their first experience in a conversation with a museum staff member was don't do something. What could be worse to do to someone visiting your institution? Today, it's very different. Today, we welcome selfies, and we spend more time helping visitors than scolding them. We're thrilled when a visitor wants to take a photograph of themselves in front of a work of art and then send it to their 12-year-old friend and share the museum. They become our voices. We don't even need to do our marketing. We allow and really desire our audiences to be the voices to be our marketing for the museum itself. And we just put all 18,000 works of art online to increase access to the collection. And the backbone of the museum learning is based on visual literacy. So back quickly to Michael Lewis and Moneyball. And if you haven't read Liar's Poker or The Big Short, I encourage it. And if you can't get to see The Big Short at the Nick, please do. This is one of my favorite slides. The game of baseball and the world of museums are grounded in history and tradition, 
Much of those histories and traditions are what we love about them, but they also can limit the potential of new histories that enrich and energize narratives, making the game better and the museums more relevant. For example, for baseball and museums, diversity was the best thing to ever happen. With more creative and cultural voices, the stronger we have become. It took a long time for baseball to understand the potential of creative statistics and to realize how some old time scouting was holding the game back. Think the Oakland A's and Billy Bean and the Boston Red Sox and Bill James. The Red Sox tried to hire Billy when he declined. The Red Sox at one point actually tried to hire Billy Bean, but he declined, and the Sox then built their empire on the notion of Moneyball and eventually won the World Series. And the New York Mets, which is another Moneyball team, was in the World Series this year, most unexpectedly. The essence for me in reading Moneyball was the courage to recognize the realities of working in small markets, such as Oakland and the Oakland Coliseum, where the players in the early 2000s actually had to pay for soda in the locker room. <laughs> Oakland, like us, has great traditions and great local support, but very few resources and opportunities. For example, the Museum of Modern Art has a great collection and a great deal of money. The Tate Gallery in London does not have a very good collection, does not have very good money, but the Tate exhibitions and scholarship is considered higher than the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Like the Tate, the PMA is quick, lean, and nimble. So that is a bit of my point of departure as I begin to talk about your museum, Reimagined. How many of you all here today are either members or business partners of the museum? Whoa, fantastic, thank you all. We are very, very fortunate and I appreciate that. I'd now like to get into some really, really serious art. And serious art, the Portland Museum of Art, tends to begin with Winslow Homer. He really is our anchor, he really is our main story that everything goes back and forward from. When I talk about the Winslow Homer studio, I like to put it in the context of Claude Monet's Giverny on the upper slide and Giorgio O'Keeffe's Ghost Ranch on the bottom, and then the Homer studio in Prout's Neck in Scarborough. These three studios are probably three of the most important artist studios in the world because they are the three places where three of the major artists, everything changed when they arrived at this place. For Winslow Homer, when he arrived in the early 1880s to Maine, he was one painter. When he lived here for the next 25 years, he became another painter. His subject matter was Maine. His subject matter was nature. I believe this is one of the most important buildings in Maine and a national cultural icon. By restoring the studio, we gained great national recognition and high brand awareness. We hired Brenda Garen and F. Murphy's Empire to redo our logo. We grew our membership, expanded our donor base, raised our level of scholarship. We created a museum about local makers. We hired Aurora to source local food. The entire museum is now aligned with new innovative Maine characterized by the qualities of Portland. The big question for us was, what do you do as an encore? That's just a look at all of our logos over the years. What do you do as an encore to the Winslow Homer studio? We decided to do your museum reimagined. We needed to spend time focusing back on the museum and the collection. We had spent so much time on Homer restoring the, the studio and opening it, we needed to come back to the museum and think about our own art collection. So one of the things we did was create a test model. I asked the curators to create a, create a space or a gallery in which a first time visitor entered that space and saw some of the great paintings in Maine. Homer, Hartley, Zorak, N.C. Wyeth, and Rockwell Kent. And the light bulb went off in their head and they said, oh my gosh, I know all these artists from my home in Cleveland, Boston, and New York, but I never knew they all worked in Maine. The connection, the essence of the Portland Museum of Art is found in that single moment visually. For our members, we wanted a place where you all could come, sit down, and enjoy your favorite painting about Maine. Basically a gallery of comfort food. So, that gallery enables to think about the collection. And from the collection, we thought about access and also about reinstalling all of the galleries. We decided it was such a large project, we would expand it over two years. And again, being in a small market, a large museum would just close for six months for a year. We couldn't afford it, we didn't want to do it. So what we decided to do was to create this process over two years. First being mostly about access, and the second about reinstallation. 
So in 2016, opening in just two weeks, what are we going to look like? First of all, a lot of our floors are being redone, and there's being a lot of painting taking place. You might not recognize that, but I can tell you, a lot of it hasn't been done since 1983. We actually have also put all 18,000 objects online. Can we run the quick 30 second? Our social media group has done some great marketing um, and we're gonna run a quick video about going online. Great, thank you. And I also want to thank Graham Kennedy and Lizzie Jones. Our communication team is doing a great job. We're getting an awful lot of views online with these videos. The other space you're going to see, whoops, is our art study room. This is also something we're very proud that we're going to be opening in two weeks. This room was designed by Scott Simons Architects. Wright Ryan did the construction and the furniture was designed by Jamie Johnston and Sherwood Hamill. This is the most beautiful room in Portland today and using some of the best quality workmanship you can imagine. If you want to see what people can do in Portland, just come take a look at this room. We also created a workshop where you can come and make works of art in relation to the collection right across from the art study room. And we published our first catalog of the collection. We've been around since the early 1880s and we've never had a catalog. And we're going to be presenting Modern Menagerie, an amazing exhibition anchoring on the work by Blackie Langley. This work of art was actually taken down from the Samoset a long time ago and we've stored it. And now we've restored it and conserved it and creating a gallery that is taking animal imagery from the collection and presenting it in a permanent space. And also obviously Davla Vipkar and some of our favorite artists. So in 17, what do we look like? This is a year from today, going to the next year. We're going to be thinking about the galleries very differently. Traditionally, museums have put paintings and sculptures and photographs and ceramics in different spaces. You're going to find during our reinstallation that all the different media are coming together in one single space to tell a single story. This is a breakdown of all the gallery themes that you're going to be seeing in the spaces in the Payson building. Each one has a checklist. Each one is going to provide the most amazing experiences that you can imagine. This is another floor as we walk through all the possibilities of our collection and sharing it with our audiences. One of the galleries in there is called Transatlantic Abstraction. And this is just a sample of what you'll see in there. A Louise Nevelson next to a Leger. Traditionally, museums have divided American art from European art, but early modernism was really a European as well as an American experience. We want to bring European and American art together in the same space. We're going to bring some of our impressionist work into the LDM sweat galleries and create a new revolving space for smaller scale shows in the Palladium Gallery. Outside right now we have the beautiful seven in front of the building and the wonderful Anthony Caro. We hope to have a new Jonathan Borowski and a John Bisbee in the Sculpture Garden on High Street. Now thinking about statistics and thinking a little bit back to Moneyball. How do you add value in a small market? We identify artists who we think deserve better recognition who aren't getting it. 
We take chances on artists because we think they're ready for larger exposure. We did that with Lois Dodd, Richard Estes, and the Tanzanian Show, in which each of those shows we collaborate with another museum for economies of scale and also greater attention. All three of these shows were reviewed in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and the Portland Press Herald. And in one review of the New York Times by Roberta Smith, she said, the Lois Dodd show is the type of show that should be in New York. That's what we're after. Membership. As I mentioned before, we have one of the strongest memberships of our size museum anywhere in the country. Partnerships. We do more partnering with other organizations, sharing audiences than competing. Sponsors. Many of you are sponsors. I cannot thank you enough. We are so proud of the sponsorships that we have at the Portland Museum of Art. And Culture Club. Culture Club is a collaboration between the Portland Museum of Art, the symphony, the stage, and ovations to try to get every single child in the Portland public school system into one of our programs every single year. We have great leaders at all three of those organizations. Free Fridays, that's another Moneyball strategy. 30 to 40,000 people come into the museum free every single year. This is one of our best goodwill gestures to our community. This really enables us to have a constant group of people coming in, excited about the museum, sharing it with their friends. Cultural tourism, another strategy that we're working on. We know the demographics in Maine are not in our favor. The best way we're gonna expand our market is actually focusing on cultural tourism. So rather than compete with the other museums in the state, we created Director's Cut last summer, which put all seven of the major museums in the state on the same platform to talk about cultural tourism. Can we grab that video, please? Statistical analysis, a lot of what we think about, again, the notion of money ball is not that we're looking for on-base percentages, but what we're trying to think about is how do we track the activities that we do so we can be as, be as good as we possibly can. Diversifying revenues, looking back, seeing where we are today, thinking about where we wanted to be in the future. Connecting those diversified revenues with the exhibition schedules to connect how many people are coming through the museum, how do we support ourselves. This is a list of our exhibitions for this coming year. Then tying it to our activity dashboard. What are our members doing? How do they interact with the institution? What do they want? What do they need? That's led us to actually change our hours this winter. We're finding so many of our members actually work, have so much going on that they'd like to be able to come to the museum later in the evening. We're gonna be staying open to six o'clock and eight o'clock during the week and on the early weekend. Your museum reimagined funding. In many ways, this is kind of a money ball budget. This is taking a look at three different bar charts, three different activities taking place at the museum. One is committed and essential, that which we're gonna to do to reinstall the collection and increase access. Funding dependent, the things we'd like to do, but only if the money comes in, and the aspirational. In many ways, by creating these three buckets, we find ways to identify donors who want to participate and how they want to participate with the museum we allow them to choose what they would like to support. It only happens if we can provide the background for them in the context. We're also very proud that with this project right now, we've raised 53% of the money from outside of the state and 19% from government. And that's not from the state of Maine, that's from the federal government. We have found that with the Homer Studio, where we raised almost 40% of that project from outside of the state, we need to find ways to expand the PMA in Portland's breadth well beyond Portland to find support outside of the region because people believe in Maine and believe in Portland. Just to give you an eye of our budget sources and expenses and how we walk through this, how we add up all of this, where we set our priorities, 
At the end of the day at a museum, the biggest piece of the pie is fundraising. Uh, the year before, we actually raised uh, almost three million in operating and then another three million in non-operating. Most of that was to purchase the Winslow Homer Studio and also to begin your museum reimagined. This year, we've raised three million, over three million in operating and uh, non-operating almost $2.3 million. That's about five or six million dollars a year. How do we track that? We like to find out how much we're spending to raise each dollar to be sure we're utilizing every dollar that's donated to the museum efficiently. We take a look at ratios and benchmark ourselves. Development right now is incredibly efficient. We actually raise about, spend about 12 cents to 14 cents on each dollar we bring in. And the market average is more between 21 and 24%. Our average over the last few years is 14% and we're shooting for about an 18 to 20%. Deep breath. I love my job. I love working at the Portland Museum of Art. My job is to enable the most amazing staff to do their jobs, to provide for our community the best opportunities to see art you could ever imagine. My job is to work with a wonderful board of trustees who believe in the institution, believe in Portland, and create the energy and the guidance to help us really navigate this difficult world that we're in today. We are very fortunate to have an amazing staff and a wonderful board supporting the projects at the Portland Museum of Art. And I am so excited that in two weeks, on January 23rd, when we reopen, we're gonna have a free community day opening up all of our doors to share all the work from this year. We're gonna have the collection online. We're gonna have the catalog of our collection. You can play and make things in the workshop. You can visit the Art Study Center and see the beautiful work. You can go see the Modern Menagerie Show, the beautiful Blackie Langley works of art, the Dalla Vipcars. You can come to the Masterworks on Paper highlights from the Portland Museum of Art Collection. One of the best parts of our collection is our works on paper. The hardest part about works on paper, photography, watercolors, and drawings, we're only, by industry standards, allowed to show them three months out of every three years. Most of our homers are actually watercolors. They're not shown that much. We wanted it open in January for our community, for our members to see the best that we have. So I encourage you to come because the hopper you see on the right of Pemiquit Light is one of the most desired objects in our collection and it's rarely on view. It is absolutely exquisite and really defines the essence of the Portland Museum of Art. We're also gonna have great Roy Lichtenstein and also a wonderful Scott Kelly, an artist from Peaks. On top of that, um, when you create great projects, you create momentum, or as a baseball term today, velocity. You create opportunities because you make things happen. When you acknowledge change and you find the opportunities in change, you get this other momentum you never expected. In the last few months, we were offered two amazing works of art that are gonna be on view January 23rd. Andy Wyeth's River Cove from 1958 is considered one of the best five paintings he ever painted. This is a gift to the Portland Museum of Art and Art Community by David Rockefeller in honor of his son who recently died. We are so proud to present this painting and you're gonna be amazed when you see it. It is just a tour de force of painting. And the other painting is a Winslow Homer from 1872. And we worked with a family with Maine roots to bring this painting in um, part as gift and part as an acquisition for the Portland Museum of Art. And we raised the additional money to purchase this from a brand new family from outside of the state who believes in our mission. So when you walk into our galleries and you walk into the museum in just a few weeks, please take a beeline to these paintings because I will be standing right in front of them and I'll be more than happy to share them with you. I love fundraising and I love money that enables the museum to do that which it does, but there's nothing more um, satisfying for a museum director than bringing in works of art that will be part of this community for generations to come. Thank you very much. So Quincy, we're gonna take questions. If anybody has any questions, I think there's two mics in, in the middle. Good morning, Mark. Oh, hey, Tony. Um, I'm gonna be your shill for a second. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I wanna share with the, the group here that uh, if you're not a corporate member of, of the museum, you really need to be. 
Um, Mark has brought more energy to this museum than I can begin to describe. But more to the point is that um, as a corporate member, one of the things you get to do is you get uh, guided tours. And you get guided tours with enthusiasm and insight. And I gotta tell you, I'm, I, I've been adult for years not taking advantage of docents. You go into a museum and you learn things you never knew about what you're looking at. It's well worth your time. So to that end, Mark, let me ask a question. You have in 2017 uh, wayfinding as part of your yep. mission. Can you talk a little bit about the technology um, as well as how you're going to bring your audience and those paintings together and alive? It's a great question, Tony, and thank you so much. We really do have a fantastic corporate partnership, and so many of you are here today, so I want to thank you on behalf of the museum. Uh, technology is, is a tricky thing with museums and something that we believe in wholeheartedly and we've now embraced through digital imagery. But at the same time, one of the wonderful things about a museum is it's one of the few places left where you can go and have an unmediated experience with a work of art. Really, the only other place to have an experience that's unmediated is probably taking a walk in nature. Um, the world is around us telling us what we're looking at, what we should do, and what we should think all the time. And so what we want to do when we open in 2017, Tony, is have a layer of um, communication with our visitor. If you want to come in and you just want to see the work of art, we're going to walk back and let you have your experience. If you want to have a conversation with someone in the gallery, we're going to provide that opportunity for that conversation. And we're also going to be working on how to use iPads and technology to go deeper into the experience you want to have. So that, again, the idea is to have a quiet meditative moment, a dialogue, or maybe digging deeper through technology to find ways in which this work of art has more meaning in your life, a relevancy, and the capacity to have a more of a dialogue with the, and with the technology. It's a complicated piece for museums, and I think some museums we're seeing, I'm not gonna blame anybody or trying, but they're either over tech or under tech, and we wanna find the ways in which you as the audiences wanna interact. How would you like to audience, I mean, what are you thinking, Tony? Are there things that you have in mind that you'd like to see? Right, exactly. I think what you're eventually going to see is mobile apps to help you get through the museum so you don't have to look at the map. You can see where you are, you're on your GPS, you press in Homer and it tells you where in the museum there's a Homer and you can go find them. And then you come up with the Homer painting and if you want more information you click on it and you can find out where that painting was made, what the period was and more information. And then if you want to find another painting like it, it's going to tell you to go to the Metropolitan Museum you know, over here. I think that's the kind of access that we're going to see. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Thank Thanks, Tony. Appreciate that. Any other? Oh. Hi, Susan Morris. I'm a Hi, Susan. Hello. condominium developer here in Portland um, and also an organizer of the events um, that bring young people into the city like Maine Startup and Create Week, very interested in the entrepreneurialism of the city and a self-confessed groupie of the Portland <laughs> Museum of Thank Art. Thank you. Here we are. Thank you. Um, now to get to the point, um, I am wondering about First Fridays. Yes. Um, and whether from the perspective of PMA, but also from the perspective of one of many great community anchors and players in this city, um, we created that event to, of course, do all kinds of goals and bring people in free of charge and get people engaged in the city. Um, and I've noticed now some organizations are moving away from First Friday because there's so much going on. I'm going to things on First Thursday. I'm going to things on first Wednesday. And I just wonder, as you look at the next year or two, how do you envision First Friday evolving, staying the same, whatever, for yourselves, as well as what guidance do you have for members of the chamber and others that wish to engage in Portland's community? That's a great question. Thank you, Susan. We are absolutely committed to Free Fridays. There's First Fridays and Free Fridays, so there's First Friday of the month when everything is open and it's really crazy. We actually are open every Friday late at night, so we think we should extend First Friday to every Fridays throughout the, throughout the year. We feel also there has been some backlash to the fact that Free Fridays is so successful, and I kind of knock my head and go, okay, so that's a problem, that there's so many people downtown buying food, shopping, and hanging out. That's not really a problem. That's an excellent um, position to be in. What we're doing is actually being open late on Thursday night 
because if you don't want to come on Friday night to the museum because it's too crowded, you can come on Thursday night. It's not free, but we are going to have extended hours on Thursday to offset some of that um, growth in the free Fridays. We still believe there's very few cities where you can have a first Friday in February where it's 15 degrees and downtown is packed. We are so fortunate to have the audiences we have, Susan, that I think we have to find more ways to encourage them. At the end of the day, what we really need to do is to find out ways to spread out Free Fridays throughout the city. As we're watching the city grow in different areas pick up, what if Washington Avenue had a first Friday? You know, what if different parts of the city, we start to expand into different areas, bring it down to the old port? How do we include more businesses in, in, into the activities so that it's kind of a commerce as well as you know, cultural experience? We're very bullish on it and we're gonna stick with it. So thank you. Anybody else? Great, well, thank you all so much for your attention. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Mark. That was a fantastic presentation. And thank you for choosing to be in Portland. I think we are so lucky to have you and your talents and your vision. You truly love your job, and it shows. And, and as a thank you for being here today, we are going to make a donation in your honor to Camp Sunshine. And since you mentioned a gallery of comfort food, I think you have earned yourself a new member. <laughs> I will be joining later today. As always, you all know you can stay updated on all of our chamber activities via Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. You can also tune into today's presentation on the chamber's website. And I do hope you will join us in February for our Eggs and Issues presentation on February 3rd. We are going to host Inside the Mayor's Office, which is an interview with Ethan Strimlane. We plan to have a conversation with the new mayor and discuss his goals for Portland. And if you register for that event, we will be asking attendees to submit questions that they would like us to ask to the mayor. It will be done in an interview style with two of us on the stage just having a conversation. So it should be a great event. I hope to see you there. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Have a great day. Thank you.